and we are live. Welcome everyone to the Tech Excellence Meetup. My name is Daniel Moka and I will uh, host, uh, co-host uh, the session of today. As you see, we have a lot of amazing, a lot of people here. Uh, so I would say, let's get started. Um, so who we are, first of all, Tech Excellence. Our vision is to raise the bar of technical excellence across the world. Uh, let me introduce you, our organizers. First and foremost, the amazing Valentina Tsupac. Uh, she is the founder and the organizer of uh, the Tax Excellence Meetups. Next to her, we have Oliver Ziller, uh, who is uh, also a co-organizer of these events. And uh, finally, here, Daniel Moka, who is also a co-organizer and the host of these events. Uh, I wanted to mention that we are also available on LinkedIn. Uh, you can uh, find us there. If you have anything to share, you can ping us, you can send us a message. We are always happy to talk about things related to technical excellence. So feel free to uh, ping us there. Okay, uh, let me tell you uh, some things about the speakers. We already have really good and exciting and informative sessions in the past. Uh, they are all recorded and can be found in YouTube. So you can rewatch those sessions. I highly recommend everyone. One can learn a lot from those. And of course, we are also planning a lot of session in the future, a lot of exciting uh, sessions. So stay tuned and be with us. Uh, so Text Excellence IO, you can find us uh, in a lot of uh, places, for example, in Meetup, YouTube, as I mentioned, where the recordings can be found and uh, the streaming is also streamed there. Uh, LinkedIn, of course, Twitter, and last but not least, uh, we, we can be also found in uh, GitHub. And uh, of course, this whole uh, Meetup would not be possible without the sponsor of Optivem. So thanks a lot to Optivem for that. Okay, uh, before I start introducing the speakers and the facilitators and the participants of the session of today, I have a special event I would like to announce. Namely, I would like we would like to do a giveaway. Uh, thanks to uh, Giovanni Paniche and the Ticino Software Craft uh, community, we received a free uh, personal subscription for JetBeans product. And right now we would like to give away to uh, one winner uh, this. Well, the question is uh, what you need to do to be a winner of this license. Well, the only thing you need to do is to send me a message, me, Daniel Moka, send me a message in LinkedIn with your email address. That's it. If you are not connected in LinkedIn, then first, of course, you need to connect with me. But after that, sending a message containing your email address. And the first person who will send this message on LinkedIn to me with their email address will be the winner of this uh, free personal license. And uh, again, thank you very much for uh, 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 Giovanni Paniche and, of course, the Season Softwarecraft uh, community who are also uh, striving for technical excellence and continuous learning. Thank uh, you, so Tech Excellence. <laughs> we do, thanks. So the game starts right now. I will keep uh, my eye on my LinkedIn messages. So uh, I'm looking forward to receive your message. Mm, next is, yeah, let me introduce then the topic of today, namely is, is test driving TikTok to exercise in a remote more programming fashion. We have uh, two great uh, facilitators. First is Alessandro Di Gioia, and the second one is Marco Consolaro. They are also the founders of Alcor Academy with the mission of promoting a culture of engineering excellence. Next to them, there will be four participants of the MOB, because as I, as I already mentioned, it will be a MOB programming session. Namely, it will be Giovanni Paniche, Dragos Rogojan, Oliver Ziller, and last but not least, Alina Liburkina. So they will be also the participants of these mob sessions. A lot of uh, great people. I'm super excited for this. Mm, yes, just shortly, what is uh, Alcor Academy? Alcor Academy is help rethinking the digital uh, transformations. Namely, they help CTOs to promote the culture of technical uh, excellence. Uh, and another uh, small uh, announcement. Uh, let's call it that way. Also, the two facilitators, namely Alessandro and uh, Marco, they are also the award-winning authors of the book, AGI Technical Practices Distills. And 
right now for all the participants of the tax excellence uh you can get this book with a 50 percent discount by following the link you can see on the bottom of this slide sheet so again uh, you can get this amazing and really informative book uh, with a 50% discount by following the link below. Okay, I think I uh, spoke enough, uh, but before I give the mi microphone over, I uh, would like to let you know that uh, please uh, feel free to ask your question in the YouTube chat, because at the end of the session, we are going to dedicate half an hour for the questions uh, asked in the YouTube channel, in the YouTube chat section. And of course, the Alex, uh, Alex and Marco will be happy to answer all of your questions. So don't forget, if you have a question, uh, feel free to ask it in the chat section. So basically, that's it. Uh, I want to hand over the microphone to Alex, Marco, and the participant of the session. Uh, I'm looking forward to this, uh, to learn from you. And yeah, the microphone is yours. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so first of all, I want to thank uh, Tax Excellence for having us today. Uh, I'm Alessandro Di Gioia. I'm Italian and have been uh, working in the in IT industry since the 1996, 97, more or less. I worked in Italy, I worked in Norway. Now I've been living in the UK for seven years. And uh, extreme programming was always my passion, software design as well. And uh, that's the reason why together with Marco, we decided first to write the book. Uh, the other co-author is Pedro Santos and, uh, and then found uh, Alcor Academy. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Alcor Academy is uh, a company that provides trainings for software development, software development teams. So what we are going to do this evening is uh, uh, a little uh, uh, experiment here, which is uh, what we do privately in our training. Uh, we don't stream our training, it's private, but uh, uh, the way our training works is through more programming and this evening is going to be very very similar to one of our lessons so i uh, let the more participant to present themselves and then we can start Joanny? oh sorry uh, you can present yourself ah uh, yes Okay, so, um, well, uh, I'm Giovanni Panice, I'm a software engineer at lastminute.com and uh, I'm, workly, I'm working uh, on the supply domain in the lastminute.com, which means that uh, when you go on, um, on the website of, uh, and you are buying some flight and so on, and you have some uh, issue, it's my fault. So, okay. So, yes. Yes. It's, uh, so when there is an incident, they call me and uh, yes, yes, this is my fault. Now, joking aside and uh, blaming culture aside. So, yes, um, <clears throat> this is what I do every day. And uh, as I mean, uh, I was introduced uh, before. I am also a member of the Chino Software Craft. So and uh, obviously uh, I am uh, a passionate of TDD and uh, all the XP practices. So. Cool. Dragos? Hey everyone, I'm Dragos Rokozan. Um, I'm from Romania. I'm a TDD enthusiast and I'm currently working with uh, Heights Digital. I work in the luxury consumer goods domain and I'm really happy to be here. Alina? Hi everyone. I'm Alina, living in Switzerland, and I'm working on medical domain. I'm really interested in whole software craftsmanship and all of those topics, so I'm very happy to be here today. And at the end of this year, we'll try to share my knowledge with you guys by Tech Excellence. Oliver? Yes, I'm Oli. I work as a full, full stack software engineer, front end, back end in the telecommunication uh, domain. I'm very interested in anything connected to extreme programming, clean code, clean architecture, whatever. 
I also blog a lot on, uh, on LinkedIn, as you may have seen. And I'm really excited to be here and hopefully learn a lot here from you guys. Let's see what we can do. <laughs> the best way to learn is to fail first. So let's try to fail sometimes and make it right. So what we're going to do is a session of remote mob programming. So uh, for who doesn't know how mob programming work, let's uh, uh, explain the rules quickly. Uh, the main roles are driver and navigator. The driver is the one that has the keyboard that is responsible for typing in the system the next thing, while the navigator is the one that should instruct the driver to what to do next, right? Uh, here, the idea is that uh, uh, the driver has a hard job trying to write the right thing. So uh, we want to protect him from the mob talking to him so that uh, only the navigator is allowed to talk to him and instruct him to on the next thing to do. That's because some mob are particularly active and then we want to avoid the situation where three people tell the driver uh, three different things to do and that's when the driver uh, is overwhelmed by things. So that's why we have these two roles that works in this way. And then we have the mob, which actually needs to agree with the uh, navigator uh, what to do next. So ideally, the navigator should always ask the mob, what should we do? And then the way that communication should happen is to start high level, start to claim the intention. Uh, I think we should do that test. And if everybody agree, then we go in details and we try to instruct the driver uh, on what to do next. Now, many times the driver knows what that means, it starts. All the time, we need to go more in detail. And this is how it works. We will rotate the uh, roles. In fact, uh, in a few seconds, the clock should appear in the window as well. But tonight, uh, since we are remote and uh, it's not really easy to exchange the control, we will fix the driver, which will be Alessandro over there. Uh, he's going to be the driver. We will rotate only the navigator between only Giovanni, Dragos, and Alina. I will be the facilitator, so I will stay in the background and I let them carry on until uh, uh, I'll uh, enter in the mob and ask questions and see uh, if we might do something better than what we are doing, but uh, uh, that's not sure. Maybe we go uh, very well since the beginning. I Let's just want see. to mention that also Oliver is in the mob, okay? Yeah, yeah. Oli is in the mob, yes, sir. of course. I, I, I call it Oli. Uh, right, and uh, so uh, yeah, so that's how it's gonna work. And uh, what we are going to do uh, today is an exercise we do often in our training, which is uh, implementing tic tac toe. Right, so uh, everybody has uh, a play tic tac toe. Uh, I don't know if you ever lost a game of tic tac toe. Usually, uh, if you are tired or drunk, otherwise, uh, uh, every match ends in a draw, right? In a tie. However, this is the game, right? It's straightforward, it's easy. Here, the idea is we want to build a library that uh, allows somebody to play tic tac toe calling the library, right? So, the idea is that. Uh, we want to implement something similar to the old-fashioned arcade game. Maybe the oldest of you remember when you went in a, a, an arcade game and you play in two people, you need to switch the keyboard, the joystick, with the other person, right? Now it's player turn, so player one do his move, then it's player two turn, and player two do his move, and so on. So we avoid multi-user we just have one library that tells which turn it is the player enter its move and then the two player switch the keyboard so we keep it simple like that right so we have rules these are the rules of tic-tac-toe right there are just five easy rules we see them in the comments there so i will say that uh, uh, the mob uh, can start, if you want, you can start discussing how we should start our test strategy, right? <clears throat> so, 
So yeah, who's the that's navigator? The test. That's the, the question. We but also, who is the navigator? Okay, so I I don't see the clock there anymore. There we go. So the first navigator is Dragos. Okay, so Dragos, okay. basically, you have to facilitate the discussion and then tell me what to do. Yes. I'm thinking that uh, we should uh, analyze the requirements and uh, <clears throat> identify one which is simple enough to start with, to identify a behavior in those requirements and uh, try to express that in a test. Does everyone agree? Agree. I agree. Let's mention that the behavior is something that changes the state of the system. Okay. So I'm looking at line at the requirement number two, for example, and I see there the first player to play will be X, while the next player will be zero. So oh, oh that's O. Oh, oh, okay. I'm thinking that we could write a test to express that behavior, to test that behavior. Um, yes, very good. Because very basically good. We, we are testing the, the initial state of the game. Very good. Right? I, I explain for the people at home, right? Uh, rule number one, the game is played on a grid that's three square by three squares. That's a constraint. That's not behavior. That's a trait, right? Of course, I use this exercise in my uh, interviews. That's why I put that uh, thing. It's a trick, right? So the rule number one doesn't have behavior. So correctly, we say, well, let's start from number two, which has a little bit of behavior, which can be very useful to give it a start. So tell the driver what to do. Okay, um, I would go at line 18 and uh, I'd, I'd name the test like uh, first play, uh, I think uh, tic-tac-toe game should, uh, should make the first player X, or I don't know if make is the, the most correct. Start with term. player X. Start with player X, yeah, I feel that. Okay. Uh, I would start with an assert that basically would assert the some state on the tic-tac-toe game. So I would have some a variable to describe this instance of the game, and that variable should have uh, a getter which says uh, uh, get current player. And uh, I want to assert that that yeah that getter should be x. Exactly, tic tac toe game game equals new tic tac toe. Game, uh, okay, game that uh, actually, no, we, we, yeah, okay, yeah, player. <clears throat> so game get current player, which should return a string. And that, String should be verified in the CRT for that it's X. This? Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. And now we should add the missing uh, classes and methods and so on. Now we can let the ID do this job, right? Yeah. 
That's why we need uh, intelligence and the uh, ideas. If we use them correctly, they are very, very helpful. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's run the test. And basically, the test fails because we try to assert that x is equal to null. Um, in order to make the test pass, I will just return x plus string x instead of null. Yeah, first passing test. Let's open a bottle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool. First test is green. Mob, do you like this or can we refactor? Uh, well, uh, if I should be, I mean, uh, follow the literature, we should, I mean, uh, wait, uh, we should apply the triangulation. No, and we should have some repetition, no, in the code. I don't know if I'm yes, wrong. But I see already a problem here. Like, do you know about code smells? So we have to rotate the navigator in the meantime. Next navigator is gonna be Oli. So here we have basically a magic string. Mm, how is it cool in terms of code smells? Depends a like primitive what... obsession, right? But well, this yeah, is it is primitive good. obsession. Yeah. But this is a primitive obsession. So we, we could... So I mean, how this, can we do better there? The simplest version would probably be something like an enum, an enum that has an X in it. So I would, I would call this thing player. Player.x. I mean, constant, yeah. OK. Cool. Now I have nothing to say anymore. Great. Carry on. So now we need a new test case where we actually switch the player. So I would write, I mean, you can copy paste this thing and then we, we change it a little bit or you write the new one. I would say something like um, switch player after, after game has been played or something or what does the mob think does that make sense Please Maybe mob, mob yourself keep the mic on because you are supposed to do i'm not on okay so um now you see um we need to actually play else we cannot switch the game. So I would say game dot, I don't know, take. Because the, you can basically take a field, so I call it take. Oh, and in Java, we don't write the methods uh, with uh, an uppercase. It's with a lower uh, case. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, would it be possible to increase uh, the font uh, again some more? And uh, yeah, so, so there were just some comments about uh, font and, and screen usage. So let, let's see how it is. And after this, we will see again uh, the audience feedback. Is this better? I hope so. Let's see mm -hmm. so if someone fr from the audience could again say how this looks like. OK. Cool.
So, and the player then should be O, not X anymore. Okay, here we have a failing test. Great, so now we need to switch the players basically. So I would uh, write, uh, I would extract a variable for X uh, field, something like current player. Yeah, and uh, you can also in instantiate it in the field directly. Because it's at X is the first player, so it makes sense to have it there. Or, uh, and then in the take, you can start with a simple if statement. So if the current, if player X equals current player, then the current player should be y, um, O, and else it should be X again. X is current player. Mm -hmm. Then what? Current player is O. So the cool thing about uh, having enums, which are strongly typed, is that uh, they constrain the values, while strings can represent anything. And uh, for this reason, then your code will become more declarative if you're using strong types instead of primitives. Furthermore, uh, here the problem is that uh, the complexity in our system is proportional to all the possible states your system is. So if you have a string, basically inside the string can be anything. So you have already an infinite range of possible states. While if you have a name, now we have only two possible states there. And that is a big difference in terms of uh, probability. Because uh, the key idea behind the scene is entropy, and entropy is a probabilistic concept. Can I add something here? Well, I think the clock is up, so somebody else is the navigator. Marco, you're, you're muted. I, it's time to rotate, but you can add something anyway, every time. So you can see it only. Uh, I feel that uh, in order to make the, the second test pass, we introduce too much code than needed. Like, I feel like we don't necessarily need that if statement. So why do you think it is too much code? Because uh, the the first test or uh, the first test uh, passes, and we in that test we don't execute the take method, but in the second we execute the take method and then get current player. So the, I would say that uh, we could just make the second test pass just by saying uh, current player equals player zero without the if. So is that going to bring us closer or? not to the final solution. Now here, the, uh, arg my argument is that we are testing a behavior. And in order to achieve that behavior, we need to have the take method. If we don't have this take method, we are implementing something else. But this take is what switch the player. So if we don't have this method, we are not building our test correctly. I think Dragos means that uh, we don't need the if statement in here. Yeah, yeah, we ah, need the take ah, method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Yes, inside the take. Uh, yes, not yet. I agree about this. Yeah, true. Ah, so the, idea, <clears throat> the idea is to write as little code as possible to make the test pass, and then with triangulation we get to what we call the obvious implementation. So in here Absolutely. we are like one step Absolutely. ahead. 
absolutely. But uh, I would say that this is a, a naive error, right? It's not, uh, my, I'm not focused about uh, is it really the minimum amount of code? Because however, we will have to write uh, this code. My focus is, uh, do we know what we are doing or are we try out things? Because uh, the point is not uh, uh, being academic in doing TDD. The point is uh, uh, arrive at the end of the task. So, you know, I, I'm not too fussy about uh, these uh, little things. Uh, I agree that we could save one line of code, uh, but uh, we would have written it uh, really three minutes afterwards. So uh, that's, uh, that's the thing. On the other we hand, it's also good to keep uh, to try to minimize writing the code because, uh, as engineers, I am guilty of uh, doing over engineering more often than I would like to admit. So <laughs> it's okay. So, what's next then? Who's the next right navigator and what's the next? Okay, thing next navigator is Giovanni. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, now we, okay, so, mm. so actually we, okay, so we have this switch with the player, so, okay. Uh, mm. Okay, so currently. Can I, can I, should I suggest something? Yeah. Um, so, there to help. so, so we, we now need to, to somehow switch it always, I guess. So I would add another test where you actually take twice and then it should be player X again. So you mean to refactor the test? No, no, you don't need to one. refactor. You can just mm -hmm. add another, another test case where you mm -hmm. take twice. Okay. okay. And then you're on, so X, to... on X again. Okay, so you're saying switch with player, uh, switch with player, uh, switch from player X, and uh, after no switch with the player zero after second move, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so create a new test, so copy from yes. Okay, so. Okay. This test, uh, at this point, I would uh, even call it makes players rotate. Right? Because if we add this test after the other two, it's basically what it proves that we, they will keep rotating forever. Right? So I like to express the behavior in my test and detach from technical thing. So here is, uh, it can be also makes play, make players rotate. No, yes, it's better. Okay, exactly. And happily, we have a failing test for the right reason, so we have to make it pass. Okay, so now we should, I mean, put <laughs> the correct behavior, no? So, okay, so we should switch it, no? So, uh, okay, if player X is equal to current player, current player equal to player zero, so, so we can uh, write it uh, as uh, uh, in the, in the right, after the if, we can put current player equal to player X. Okay, we can see what uh, the tests say. Now we made uh, this one pass, but this one fail. Exactly. So, yes, because the one is to Okay. 
The problem is that we are, I mean, um, if Relix current player, current player switch on player zero. So, okay, start with player X, make player switch. Okay, switch to player Well, the zero. issue is, is, do you have no L's? I mean, you always set the current player to player X. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, sorry, forget. So, because I really hate the yes, so <laughs> <laughs> because we should have a return, no, in the line eleven. So, yeah, true. Pub, you know, public speaking. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we are all happy now. So one of the rules of object calisthenics says to avoid the else keyword. Yeah, the exactly. Reason, the reason is because uh, we want to maintain a main execution lane and then return early if some of the preconditions are not met. Are not met. Also, this uh, prevents uh, um, a lot of uh, branching of execution paths in our code. So ideally, even if in this case, you know, it's trivial and maybe it's even better written this way, we usually propose to write something like this. And then mm -hmm. keep the else all together. This still works. Okay, I want to underline something. Okay, maybe it's, it's, it's something that is easier for the others. So if, uh, we have used the, a method like take, no? Which is void. Okay, we don't return nothing, no? Exactly. So we, we check it uh, uh, because we do the get current player, no? Because we are, I mean, uh, using an approach of command and, and query approach, no? Yeah, so command take, query preparation, yes. So take okay. a command and uh, get current player is a query. A query should not change state. A command exactly. could return state if you want to see if the operation is successful. But in mm -hmm. general, a command changes the state without exposing the state. Exactly. Okay, so now we have, I mean, the, the state of, I mean, the, oh, fuck, I have finished my time. Time to rotate. Don't worry, don't worry, if, even if your time is finished, not that you have to shut up, it's just ah, that yes. you have to take over, but the whole point is that people, you discuss things together, especially if you're disagreeing. So Dragos, for example, you could have said that uh, the if was redundant, way earlier and that would be okay okay <clears throat> so this is why we say keep your microphone on and uh, discuss with other people okay you want to scale out on the brain okay okay next navigator is alina uh, so i assume we could start playing the game now um uh, nothing to work after here we are all green I, I, I would refact the first. Uh, maybe could we switch to, I don't know, Elvis operator on the right side? Would that make sense? Switch what to what, sorry? Uh, Elvis operator, if you go to if, you can make alt enter, I guess, and it would suggest you to refact. Ternary operator, I guess. Uh... Okay, to do the ternary operator, I think I need the else back. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, probably. Could you run tests here? Cool. Any any other duplication you see? Um, let me see. So I have a, a little thing here, right? Uh, ternary operator in this case is nice, right? Because we are assigning something, so there's no much logic inside. But still, it's cryptic to me, right? Can we give some meaning? So this thing somehow. Mm -hmm. well, okay. more corrected to to a method called switch players. Private method, right? That's a good mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. 
that's cool, right? Because now it doesn't matter if it's complicated inside. Now I see what it does. I trust it does it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Let's run the test to make sure that refactoring didn't break anything. So good. What else can we refactor? So maybe I would need to help with the mob. Do you see so for, for, for me, it looks OK. What, what about the others? Mm, also, for me, it's OK. It's, uh, I mean, only a comment uh, about uh, the extracting the private the private um, method. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yes, um, usually when I see a pr private method, sometimes it's you know an idea of uh, some 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 new responsibility. But I don't know. It's so simple here, so um, I don't know. Um, forget about that. So because sometimes I prefer that uh, to leave it as it is. So. But you want to simplify a bit the you know the the if so but okay the condition well, but usually I I suggest to write obvious code instead of just mm -hmm. old code. And the idea of the obvious code is to express intent and make it explicit and hide mm -hmm. implementation details. Suppose that in the mm -hmm. future we find that switch players or at least this operation is very expensive, and we mm -hmm. find a better way, more complicated, okay. From the high level perspective of the take method, the intent doesn't change because we are switching the players. How we do that, it's our concern. Maybe we are calling a remote service that does it for us very, very quickly. I don't know. The idea is that in this way, we are high, um, elevating the um, level of abstraction and separating the concerns of what we want to do from how we achieve it. This is why we like to have private methods. The good thing is that after you extract enough private methods, you can you can see that sometimes you can cluster them. And that's when the private method are telling you that there is a collaborator in there that is scattered in your code that is too procedural. And then you can extract the class and move those private methods to that class and delegate to it. So okay. the thing that I would like to um, refactoring here is the creation of the game uh, instance, which is okay. I mean, but it's repeated ah. three times. It's making our test needlessly verbose. And uh, you are saying you want to refactor the test? Yeah. The test okay. is citizen code, so it has to be maintained as well. And for this reason, I would like to uh, introduce a field for this one. And I want to initialize this in the setup. So the cool thing about uh, having an ID is that it can do this kind of transformations for us. And then it's just a matter of a couple of keystrokes in this work. It's important to make sure that <clears throat> the game is initialized in the before each and not in here. Otherwise, we will be sharing the same instance, which makes the game a shared mutable state between tests bleeding to flaky tests. So if you have tests that sometimes pass, sometimes don't pass, there is a chance that you are sharing state between them behind the scenes. OK, cool. So it's all green. And if you don't see anything else to refactor, then we have to move forward. Uh, yes, I think that's it's OK. We have no, to rotate. Good. Next navigator is Giovanni. Again, OK. Awesome. OK, so uh, can, you, can we see again the, you know, the requirements? So in order to, to see again the, OK. OK, so. Now we have, I think that we have implemented the switch. No, the first player to play will be X, while, while next one play will be O. Okay, so I think that this one is done. I don't know what they mm -hmm. think about mm -hmm. the mobber, or I don't know. Mm -hmm. This behavior, I think, is is okay now. Yeah, that is done. Okay, okay. So we can go to the third point. So player cannot play uh, on an on an already played square. 
okay? Okay, so what we, it's now is we should, I mean, uh, start uh, with, I mean, the idea of the square, no? So the, our grid, I think, no? Okay, awesome. Uh, the thing here is that, uh, I mean, as a requirement is, I mean, very, very um, open. So because uh, it, it say, okay, uh, another player cannot, I mean, uh, 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 be in the same square, but we don't have <laughs> a square actually. So, <laughs> so we can start. Yeah, and to... <laughs> we don't even have what should happen if exactly. the place can already play its square. E exactly. So maybe we can, I mean, uh, um, I don't know. Uh, we can, um, we can um, start from another st another simpler thing so like uh, i don't know uh, to uh, insert no yeah, the the, um, the 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 point so the the x or the o no the, the first one should be the x no in the grid okay so uh, can i make a suggestion yes yeah so I guess we already have to take, so now we could say, for example, what to take a field. And I mean, if I, if I imagine that thingy, it, it's a field that has probably some coordinates or so. So we could add the, a field class or something to the take. But first we have to start with the test. Okay. And exactly. then the yeah, exactly. Is mm -hmm. creation. Yeah. yeah. So what can we test here? Uh, well, uh, we can test the position, no? So we can that sorry, not the position, but we can ins uh, we insert something in the grid, no? We want to insert something in the grid and check where is the maybe we won't see the, the grid. Maybe we want to see the grid. We don't want to see the grid, right? That, mm. That's the trick here. We want to test something. Definitely inside the test, uh, we need to implement something more in this take, but we want to test it and stay as outside as possible from the implementation. Mm. So okay. either we have two options uh, to carry on with. Either we test the take uh, in the same position. Right? And so mm -hmm. to me, if the first player is X, X play in one square, right? Mm. Then the yeah. second is O. Oh, please, in the same square as X. And the minimum requirement there is that the player do not rotate anymore because the, okay. the uh, uh, application should know that that square is already taken. So that, hey, the okay. square is already taken. You have to choose a different one. So it's still okay. the, the turn of the other player. Okay, something like tic tac two game should not insert in the same grid the second um, uh, the, the second step, the second uh, round. I don't know. Should not override the field. Yeah, or override the field, so it's simpler. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry, what's the name of the test? Okay, tic tac two game should not allow. No, uh, tic tac no game should. Sorry, it's the name of the class. No, so not allow to uh, not allow to um, overwrite, as Oliver said, overwrite the same the same position. Okay, if we uh, use the same method, take no. So what Oliver suggests, so take should con should have also the position, no? So we can say the position in the grid. So something on the uh, row and the column, no? So we can uh, say uh, game.take. And we can introduce a new class, for example, position, new position inside. So it uh, will be created in the ID automatically. Position. And we can say position. Uh, okay, maybe I, I see uh, Marcos uh, 
maybe it's too much far away from maybe now i'm going too far away because we are saying we can have a grid of made by one one uh, I, I would child. start with the assertion maybe marco ah, yes. yeah my, my reasoning is simple right we have a three by three grid it's always three by three it never changes they are nine places is it yeah. worth to have a bi-dimensional class to just represent nine things? I perhaps we can use something simpler. Uh, well, yes, we can use. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the you know uh, the uh, I don't know uh, you know one and two, so only the you know the row and the column. I don't know. Yes, but uh, but then we have the problem of uh, uh, primitive obsession. And exactly. Then, uh, we have to add a lot of validation. Like, is this exactly. within the range? Is it starting exactly. from zero or is it starting from one? What happens exactly. if I pass a negative number or a number too big? What is an alternative to that? Think about it. The whole mob. Mm. Okay, think about it. Maybe from home, some suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we already use it. It's already there. So did I hear it right? Um, you propose to normalize from one to nine. Yeah, probably yes. And then um enumeration, right? Again, it's always nine position, and now we can call it in a meaningful mm -hmm. way, right? Top left, top middle, bottom right, right? We give a name that um, connects with our mind and we know where they are playing. So also making the test is going to be easier. But it's time to rotate. The tool say Alina is next navigator. Great. Navigator, can I make a suggestion? Um, the top left should be all uppercase in Java. Yeah, can true. You... But I know everything uppercase. Mm -hmm. So I heard another suggestion that we should start with assertion. Mm -hmm. We need mm -hmm. to think of what we <laughs> assert here. Um, assert equals probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we assert position top left. Mm -hmm. So le let's uh, let's have a look at the title of the of the test and see if we can find some suggestion. The idea was that if you try to play it in the same place, it doesn't rotate the player basically. Right? It's like ignoring the move and not even switching. Okay, then we need to get the current player again. Let's gain the current player. And when we assert our player is X, right? Or should we assert not equals? No, it should, it should be O. Well, this, the first one should be X, but the second one should also be X. Yeah, the second you one should be because it doesn't rotate. I just yeah, it mean, should you... be O, but we need to play twice in there, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So which player should uh... I think it should be still X because we didn't we won't rotate and then because so in the beginning the player is X. Yeah. X play top left. Then it switched to O. O was to play top left and they said they no, you can't still O top left, still O, top left, still O. Right? So we are all here. You understand? Uh -huh. mm. Yeah, true. Not quite yeah. sure. But, well, he, he, after the first take, um, we switch to O. So the yeah. second time he can take again, but then he cannot take, so he stays in O. Maybe we can, I don't know, an exception. So, I don't know. Uh, 
I, I, I don't think we need an exception here. Why? It's not an exceptional case, right? I agree. Well, you just we need to be careful. We have the same thing for not, but it's, uh, it's not really uh, useful in this uh, situation. I think you can resume it from that. Because you can still, I mean, you just play until the player switched. So that's why I wouldn't make an exception. In that case, you have to check that you are uh, with the next player. Again, I didn't hear you. If you, for example, no, uh, the thing here is if I game game take position top left, no, and then I do game game dot take position top left. I don't I don't uh, return nothing, or I mean, I don't uh, throw an exception. What I can check, I can check that uh, the current player is always the the second one. He's not switched, so mm -hmm. I don't know if you get. So what mm -hmm. we can check yeah. is that the current player is not switched. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly, if we don't exactly. want to, to do uh, the exception. Now I get finally why it's O. <laughs> <laughs> you understand now, Alina? Yeah. Exactly. So I think uh, we need to fix the test before, because the test before is exactly like this one. Instead, uh, the second should play on a different one. Right? I, I have a question, but I don't want to start a flame. But why you don't like the, the exception solution? So it's OK. I understand that it is not exceptional, no? but uh, it's something that uh, you should not do to, um, to put something in the, you know, uh, the same position that is previously. So, so that is a design decision. In general, exactly. I, yeah. I, use, I use exceptions for things related to not to the domain, but to the infrastructure layer. If I run a, a, a out of space on the hard drive, that's an exception for me. But uh, if I, let's say, I'm modeling uh, booking on an airplane and I overbook, that is something that is designed to happen. It's not the happy path, but then it's part of the domain. So I want to model the error as well. And as a part of the error, maybe it's the take that returns an enum that has a specific meaning saying, OK, this operation failed in a model, in my, in my domain model, explaining the reason. If I throw an exception in here also, I'm basically saying I'm throwing out of the window the whole game because you made a mistake putting, uh, putting the, the, the movement, which is a bit you know, unforgiving. And as a user experience, <laughs> it's a bit harsh. It's like really. So, the, the, there are many, many more considerations about this. So, there's a fantastic book from uh, Scott Weloshin, uh, where uh. He talks about uh, domain modeling made functional, and he discusses a whole chapter about uh, uh, kinds of errors and how to model them. So, one of them is to actually describe errors, possible errors in your domain, like you know. Uh, a delivery company losing one of the uh, items from the truck. It's something that can happen. It's not the, the happy path, but it's something that can happen. Uh, running out of memory, it's an exception. I, so let's I, rotate around, I think. Dragos, next navigator. OK, so uh, we added the position argument to the take method. So now we need to make the previous test uh, be valid. I so did uh, yeah, in the make player switch uh, test, I would uh, add another position on the second game take method call. So maybe top right. Done. OK. Wrap test. <laughs> Show it. Show, prove it. I don't see your screen moving or. Oh, it is. Uh -oh. I don't know if, if it's me or. I don't know. I My, see. For me, the, the screen is stuck. 
Ah, okay. So well done uh, for you. <laughs> but basically, we we are still having the last test not passing because we haven't implemented the take that ignores the position when the uh, tile is taken. Cool. Now it's correct. Fails for the right reason. Dragos, it's still stuck for you? Yeah, it's still stuck. Maybe someone can continue. Instead of me. Okay. Okay. Is there some sound in the background? Uh, maybe if everyone could go on mute and then uh, I'm not sure is it okay okay can you hear me yes it's fine okay yeah uh, what an energetic session I love that to be honest it really showed it really showed the difference between working together in a team than working in isolation what I meant by that is you guys, you know, continue to share the knowledge. Also, what I really love that uh, Alex was explaining some ideas, what is primitive obsession, uh, why it's good to extract method, etc. So we continuously, we real time teaching our uh, fellow colleagues and peers about software engineering. And it really showed, I really like it. Like the, it's, 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 it's all about the synergy, right? Synergy of the team all together. As you said, there is one brain and we are uh, driving this all together. So great job. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we need to we need to start the uh, QA section. We have uh, plenty of uh, topics and uh, questions in the YouTube chat. So I would say let me let me start and go through them. And uh, please, Alex, Marco, uh, we will uh, uh, would like to hear your answers on those or opinions. So first of all, there is a question from Ilias. Why didn't the navigator ask the mobs option? Uh, maybe I'll give you a context. At the beginning, I think, uh, you know, when we started the Navigator, uh, you know, said something or recommended, but didn't ask, ask the, the mobs option, the other participants. So the question is, uh, should it be like that or uh, what should it look like? Uh, what, do you, what do you think about it? Who wants to answer? Go for it. I mean, you started it with, uh, with the... Yeah, yes, but, the uh, I wasn't really navigating, so I don't know why the navigator did ask for the mobs option. Well, the idea, well, the idea is that uh, if uh, if no one disagrees to let it flow, then uh, we go on with that. Instead, if someone disagrees or wants to understand better what's going on, then they can interrupt. Because if we keep saying, "Okay, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think?" it becomes, you know, a bit uh, mechanical and not fluent enough instead if we let the the, the mob intervene naturally uh, after a while this discussion becomes uh, fluent on its own yeah i, I would add that uh, uh, there is also a matter of maturity in there right so uh, our goal is to deliver software fast uh, and through the mob it's about everybody understand what is going on so if uh, the navigator knows what to do express his intention everybody's agree ah, let's do it yeah we don't have always to uh, stay there to chit chat if instead somebody disagree it's the mob responsibility to raise their hand and say wait why do we do that and then we debate it right so that's a little bit why excellent so it makes the wall flow smoother and the sort of silence means then agreeing and just let it go. And uh, of course, what we are doing is let's uh, make the customers happy and write the code for them. So we want to be fast and early, of course. Yeah, very good. I think it was uh, totally understood. Thank you for the answer. The next one is, uh, here it is from Nicolina. Uh, does the person typing the code have any, any say? Or are they literally only allowed to type and not discuss? No, no. So the idea of the driver is that uh, uh, doesn't have to think. Okay, many, many times even pair programming is done in a poor way, I would say, because many people that pair has the driver that is also, you know, the coder. 
and the navigator that well the navigator the, the other person is there trying to follow but most of the time you end up watching at your phone is answering the email so that's not really pairing so what we propose is what uh, the inventors of uh, uh, more, more programming um, stated is strong pair programming strong pair programming is the precursor of mob programming which basically the idea is if you have an idea you give the keyboard to the other person so the other person has the only task of writing the code and learning maybe if they are not fluent with the IDE, the language or the system. While you have the idea, you have the context and you have to verbalize it. Remember also when debugging, we know about the um, rubber duck technique of telling, pretending to tell someone what's the problem. And as you tell it, you realize what's the problem, right? It's exactly that. It enforces communication. It improves learning and understanding and the removes the stress of the person that is typing okay so the idea is that it's not that you're not allowed but you're not required okay actually you can ask questions to clarify for example oh i don't know java that well how how do i write an assertion that's a total valid question or sorry what is the name of the test i couldn't understand what you were talking about so these are all this kind of discussion but of course if they have an idea they can contribute but they don't have to and uh, I would uh, I would add that uh, it depends what uh, situation you are in the mob, right? Sometimes you are writing a lot of code, uh, and there's somebody with an idea is going with this flow. He has the idea is uh, telling you what to write. At that point, uh, the driver needs to focus on write uh, what the navigator say without re even understanding. He has to trust the navigator. Okay. But there are other situations where the mob is stuck. We are in analysis paralysis. We are trying to uh, put their uh, points about the design. And in that situation, the driver has to step in the discussion if he has an idea, right? He, the, the point is, if we understand what is going on, if he has an opinion, it's not writing stuff, it's discussing stuff, design discussion. So he's definitely allowed to speak. But as soon as the mob agree to something, okay, boom, back to right uh, and listen to the navigator. Amazing. I really like this description. Also that you mentioned that the navigator uh, should trust the driver. And uh, I really like that because, you know, trust is namely the prerequisite of successful uh, collaboration uh, within software engineering. So I think that's key point. Thank and you. also we know from Patrick Lencioni's book, The Five Dysfunction of the Team, that trust is the fundamental uh, prerequisite for functional teams. And this is why we believe that mob programming is so effective because mob programming forces people to show vulnerability, okay? Forces people to show that there are some things that they don't know. And that's totally okay. The moment we normalize, there are things that we don't know, okay? The, the environment becomes healthier immediately. And that's when people start realizing they have special perspectives and those are all valuable. We don't want a team of clones. We want a team of diversity where everyone can see the blind spots of each other and work together. That's how you build trust, showing that you are just a man or a person like everyone else. Wise words, wise words very much. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the answers. Let's uh, jump to the next one, which we I think we already overlapped the answers a bit, but uh, let's see, we can talk about this topic. Uh, so yeah, there were some great questions uh, so far and discussing the boundary of the two roles and how strict is the boundary is. Maybe here, can you please uh, uh, tell us more information about this, how strict the boundaries are and uh, what are yeah, That's a funny question, right? Uh, good boundaries make good neighbors, uh, they say, <laughs> right? Uh, oh, well, it, it depends on the team, right? Uh, it depends on the maturity on the team. It depends on how the team is used to work together and uh, what's the collective mindset of the team. I will say the stronger the collective mindset, the less we need rules about anything. So uh, here it's uh, really difficult to say big boundaries or no boundaries. I will say in the beginning, I will set rules because uh, everybody needs to adapt a little bit. 
But then as we carry on as a team, and I will say days and weeks, uh, right? Not hours. Uh, then the things start to get smoother, and then we can see if we can uh, uh, bend the rules for the benefit of the group. Exactly. So I am not very uh, a fan of rules. I consider mm -hmm. rules uh, a learning thing. So the more the team learn to collaborate, the uh, least they need the rules uh, and uh, uh, being strict about uh, that. Well, that's my opinion. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally agree. Agility also applies here, right? We should not follow the strict rules. They are just guidelines, right? Not rigid rules. And uh, we should, uh, you know, we should be agile with these techniques and we should adopt or say we should be flexible, right? So it totally yeah. applies here as well. Well, there is a there is a website from Jay Babuzi where he has a, a list of mob programming patterns. Okay. okay. And uh, I mean, there are, there are many, many ways of doing mob programming. As Marco mm -hmm. said, as you became more become more experienced, context becomes more relevant, so you can bend the rules. But there are different ways. So there is the prima donna way of doing mob programming. So the navigator is basically a dictator. Or there is the kidnapper. So the driver goes on his own spree and everyone else is like, oh no, what's happening? Okay, so there are many, there, there are many flavors of this. It's up to you, honestly. Uh, but the idea is to be pragmatic and use this tool to deliver better and communicate better, not to, you know, force people in roles. Now I'm going to share the, the link in here. Let's yeah, see. please, let's not make it become a ceremony. We already yes. have enough ceremonies. So no reason in here, it's fine. We will share the link soon in the comment section. So for everyone listening to this live stream, you can find it there and check those uh, links out. Okay, the next one is then, uh, yeah, it is not a question, but maybe a recommendation from uh, Patty, uh, Patty Koch. Uh, his more programming looks easy, but it is not. I recommend reading the book Code with the Wisdom of the Crowd, Get Better Together with progr uh, More Programming to Get Started. It's 100 pages. Uh, I think I also just released a new version of that book okay. just today. So absolutely read it. It's from the inventors of the of the mob programming technique. So definitely uh, is a skill. Mob programming, it's a skill. Okay, It's not just a tool. So it, ha it requires practice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Say hi to yep. Patty Cocker, hey, our friend from Switzerland. Happy he was watching us. Hey, Patty. Yeah, he's a really uh, active uh, member of our community. We are grateful for him. And I totally agree with what you said about that soft skills. I mean, uh, pair programming, more programming, they require soft skills. If they don't have them, they need to work on that. Otherwise, uh, you know, the collaboration won't work. So soft skills are required. Yeah. We, we, as you can imagine, we uh, try to promote a, a culture of learning. And mm -hmm. the idea is that the moment you can communicate and mob programming and pair programming, strong pair programming is a way of doing that. Then you're promoting a culture of sharing your knowledge, but also a culture of mentorship, which is something that should be enforced even more. If you're out there, if you're a junior developer, one of the most important things you can do is find a mentor out there. There's plenty of people that have a lot of experience that can get you, help you get you started and avoid all the mistakes, which are not the technical bit that are important. It's the life lessons that are important. You know, even how to go through an interview, how to select a company or, you know, these kind of things, what to focus on when you are in your path, in your career. Those are the things that are life changing, in my opinion. Yep. Yeah, those those recommendations are priceless. Exactly, they can make a. I mean, a mentor can make a big difference uh, in a, in a, for for a, for a mentee, for juniors. Excellent. Uh, let's go to the next one. This is a question this time. Uh, yeah, there was a situation where so from Nicola, Nicolina uh, Dragos uh, Dragos uh, suggested to remove the if statement. Do any of you actually practice in TDD backtrack like this? Uh, well, I, I answered the, uh, in the beginning, I didn't really understand the question. I thought that uh, it was about uh, removing the call to the 
trick method, I think it was. Uh, they backtrack like that. Uh, to me, deleted it, uh, deleting it to re-add it the next time is a waste of time. Uh, if uh, it is something like this, uh, I uh, favor pragmatism to the academy, but I will carry on. I always carry on. Exactly. I just want to mention that. Uh, I just want to mention that if you are approaching test-driven development and these are the first times you are trying it, then I would say, okay, undo it because the lesson that is not to be applied in production straight away until you're expert. But as you are learning, the lesson is how do I minimize over engineering and how do I make sure that each of my each line of my code is exercised okay we have a matrix which is code coverage but code coverage tells us that a line has been executed doesn't tell us if that line has been tested okay for example we're dealing with uh, legacy code you want to make sure that if you are adding tests to your solution before doing the refactoring you also do a round of mutation testing because mutation testing tells you which lines are not exercised and which execution paths are actually not covered by your test harness even though the coverage is 100 percent okay so the idea is as you are since you are learning or if you are learning be strict with the rules so that then you can step forward okay so on one side what Dragos suggested is i would say a very good suggestion if you are still learning the cadence and the practicalities once you are in production you would probably not even write a test that is this small okay you will probably write something that is bigger that is uh, uh, maybe involving um, even more of the system doesn't matter the idea is if you're learning as you are learning stick more to the rules and as you become more competent you will understand when those rules apply and can be skipped. Marco used to uh, present uh, the um, ways of uh, acquiring knowledge uh, from uh, MIT uh, for jet drivers in uh, the US uh, Air Force. And uh, the most advanced is the, is the um, expert level, which reads the context. Okay, an expert knows the rules, but understands the context so that he knows which rules apply, which rules don't apply, and he's a, it's called a pragmatist. So someone that knows, knows the craft, but knows how to not be academic at all costs. Yeah, so this is the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition. And uh, actually, this is a nice example I always make uh, every time we start to teach test driven development to the people, right? So actually, the uh, expertise for that moment, from that model, is somebody that he has naturalized the rules, right? Mm -hmm. And the example is about when you were learning to drive your car, right? If you remember when you were trying to get your driving lessons, the first time you had a big checklist in your mind, and everything was, okay, so now I need to sit down, check the mirror, then press the right pedal, and then the key, and then the accelerator, and then the gear, and then look around if it's okay, and then start, right? Big checklist, right? Now, when you go in the car, you don't have any checklist anymore. Now you do all these things naturally. You don't have to go in your memory, right? Because now you are an expert. That's the difference between a novice and an expert. Now you go in your car, you do all these things automatically, the only thing you do is check around to see if there's or other car. That's something you did before and you do also now because that is the feedback. That is about checking the context. The context changes every time. So that's where your eyes are. But the rules are so natural for you that they are not rules anymore. You know how to drive your car. Same thing. Oh, like this is an excellent uh, discussion, and I guess it goes uh, back around the really famous quote, uh, learn the rules, break the rules, make up new rules, and break the new rules. And I think this is where we go into the whole transition between uh, rule following, 
<clears throat> versus understanding the essence, like what are the principles behind the rules? What, what are the, the why? And that's actually the deeper uh, understanding. And that's why when people initially, they will uh, try to mechanically follow the rules and may even apply good rules, but in a bad context, leading to possibly bad results and even to possibly saying these rules don't work. But actually what's mm. missing is the practice, getting that, that deeper uh, understanding and going to the principles, the why. And when you have the principles, you actually have a much, much richer uh, uh, understanding or connectivity in your mind than, than any of the rules. And that's actually the ultimate expertise. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I like uh, more the Picasso quote, learn the rules uh, like a pro so you can break them like an artist. <laughs> yes. That's exactly. very good. So an example of applying uh, the rules blindly is, uh, for example, saying, okay, data class are bad. Okay. So if you, if you take Martin Fowler's book, he says data class bad because they bring you to anemic domain models. I agree. Your domain, you don't want that. But if you're doing functional programming, well, that's another thing. And also, if you are at the boundaries of your system and you are trying to communicate with other systems, you can't share your memory. Okay? You can't say, okay, read my internal memory of this machine. Then <clears throat> what you do is that you, you need the data class to communicate between systems. And that's when data classes are okay. So depending on where you are, the rules apply or doesn't. And that's why code smells are hints and not rules. There are no rules in software, okay? The only, um, I would say, uh, well, uh, there's, let's say there's no silver bullet, okay? So we have to be, you have to understand that. Uh, Maybe uh, better. <laughs> we, have, we, have heuristics. we have heuristics, okay? <laughs> software is based on math, but it, you know, bridges the gap with the physical world. So it's dirty and bad. <laughs> <laughs> very good no rules only guidelines and yeah we should never be dogmatic about these uh, rules uh, let's jump to the next one it is a sort of uh, opinion from uh, wolfgang klinger the last the last refactoring is controversial the setup method somehow obscures intentions at times it is often clearer to have the steps directly in the test to see what's going on I don't know whether you can remember, but it was it was when you refactored the setup method in the test. So what is your take on this uh, comment? Yeah, I agree with the comment, but in this situation, it was more of an example of the rule of three, also to mm -hmm. uh, show an example that you can use the setup method. It, it depends. I would say some, uh, some scenario, yes, and some scenario, no, I don't have a strong opinion. Well, to me, the um, so there are frameworks that literally consider the setup method an anti-pattern. Okay, the point is that depends as always on the context. So, if we are doing integration tests, integration tests require some kind of you know um, creation of the system, and you don't want to do that repeatedly, okay, because it takes a lot of time. Also depending on how well designed is your system, the setup can be very verbose. Hopefully not, but can be very verbose. So at least the wiring I would put in the setup and then in the arrange part, I would expose the intentions. So if my setup, so the, if the creation of my system has some intentions as well, is a bit strange. So I, I would just put the setup in there. Why would I not use the setup? So the real reason why I would not use the setup is if I'm running the test concurrently. So if I'm, if I'm running the test in parallel, then I would segregate completely the instance, creating one in each test and not having the same instance uh, at the class level, because that could still be uh, problematic. Excellent additions. It again shows that all roads leads to the sentence. It depends, right? Always. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but it's good. It's good to have these kind of um, statements because it shows that the audience is uh, uh, well prepared, and that uh, we are dealing with different uh, uh, with different aspects and different scenarios. 
okay? So depending on where you are, some rules apply, some rules don't apply, just as we said before. And it's interesting to discuss about these things because everyone gains from it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the next one. It's also from the same uh, person, Wolfgang Klinger. Uh, he says, some say commands never fail, so no exceptions from the domain. I think here he's referring that you guys wanted yeah, to. Yeah, I, 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 I totally subscribe to this, uh, in my opinion. So I'm not that religious about commands should not return anything, okay? Because it's interesting to know if the command uh, succeeded. Not through an exception, okay? In my domain, I want to model the errors. I want to model all the outcomes, not just the happy path. And the moment we can give a name to the errors, the moment we can give name to things, then we can start um, defining behaviors for them. So this is what usually you hear about when we are dealing with primitive obsession, for example. When we are fixing primitive obsession and finding abstractions and collaborators, what happens is that you find a class or a, an object, an, an abstraction that we call behavior attractor. The moment you find the name for a concept that was implicit in your code, suddenly a lot of your code that is scattered away gets attracted to this class. And that's when your code becomes declarative because you are delegating the execution to this collaborator. Previously, instead, this collaborator was not materialized, so you had to write a lot of procedural code. And this is one of the reasons why fixing primitive obsession is so important. On the other hand, we have to be careful because if we have a primitive obsession obsession, then we have a lot of boxing and unboxing when it's not needed, and that can be uh, detrimental for performance. So as, all, as, uh, as always, we have to know what we are doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. I think uh, we still have time for one more uh, question or points or opinion. Uh, let's uh, bring it on uh, from Dennis uh, Zahuk. I agree with Giovanni. Without technology, it is possible to draw an X over a uh, circle. That command is possible. However, however, it is not legal within the rules of the game. Do you have any additional uh, comments regarding? So the idea in here is uh, it's very similar to the one before, right? So on one side, we try to make wrong state not representable, okay? So why we are trying to make not state rep uh, wrong state not representable? Because we don't want to add too many validations in, your, in our code. We want to limit the way the user can interact with our code so that it doesn't make mistakes. How annoying it is where you go into the ATM and then you say, okay, I want to withdraw 50 pounds. And then it proceeds. And on the next screen, it says, no, only multiple of 20 pounds are available. Why are you telling me afterwards? Okay. So making the wrong state not representable, make our code not even compile if something should not happen. For example, having an enum for... Um, for the position or even a class that does the validation as you create the position itself okay it's better than just using straight away integers because integers and other primitives booleans um collections or arrays uh, strings they can they can represent almost anything they are the base of uh, uh, our building blocks and for this reason they don't have context types bring the context so if we don't have types, we have to bring the context ourselves. And that's why how our code becomes extremely procedural. Okay, So this is all tied together. In this case, unfortunately, it's very difficult to make you know, the code not compile if, uh, if we are doing the wrong movement. Okay, <laughs> maybe, we can, we, maybe we can think about uh, designing a type, but it would be, I think, a, a bit of over-engineering from this case. <laughs> On the other hand, adding a validation and then a return value from the track, uh, from the take um, method to express, oh, operation successful or no uh, time taken would be perfectly uh, available. And that, this, is why there is, this is the reason why many times in functional programming, you have the result type, 
or the, even the option type if sometimes you don't you are not expecting always a result from an operation um unfortunately we cannot see uh, the code written in the other way uh, but uh, i want to, to underline a thing that uh, alessandro said uh, using the dnm you are using the type system to, you are using the type system in order to avoid uh, something that is not valid so in this case you are uh, you are you you you, uh, you don't need to write all the, the validation i think this is a great point so avoid to i don't know if you i mean you in the real life when you write your code with a lot of things to write to validate in this case which is i mean a better choice no yeah, the compiler the does it for you you don't have to write tests for it it's the compiler straight away so the the set of soft the programs that allow you to to put the position in the wrong place is uh, zero there's no way that you can compile it and that's why it's powerful also it's more expressive and makes the code declarative again so instead of saying how to do things we declare what we want to achieve amazing points thank you very much also giovanni to add your two cents uh yeah the time is up so let me uh, please wrap this up this session first of all i'm going to present again this slide sheet so again the two facilitator uh marco and alex was the he, they are the founders of the awkward academy they are helping ctos to promote the culture of technical excellence and of course they are the authors of this uh, really great book uh, AGI technical practices distilled and uh, if you want to grab a copy of that uh, you can use the link below and you can get a 50 percent discount uh, from that book so I would like to say thank you for everyone for this really great session I think we all learned a lot of course especially thanks for uh, Mark and Alexander and also huge thanks to the participants because we are together uh, we uh, the teamwork makes the uh, dream work. So thanks a lot also for Valentina as well. And of course, the most important ones, the audience. Thank you very much for everyone for your participation, for your activity. And uh, we're looking forward to, your next, to the next session uh, together. So thanks a lot for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.